I don't like Tom Cruise, but I have to admire how he deliberately chooses the most difficult way of making a film. Similarly, whatever you may think of the poet, you've got to be impressed by Jerusalem Deleted, the most recent and formerly most ridiculously tight epic by Simon Jarvis. Jarvis, you there? At your service, sir. Gage heads up display. Sorry, actually this Jarvis. Now just to give you an idea of what this masochist has done, Jerusalem Deleted is an entire epic composed of exactly 1400 stanzas, all written in an ABABABCC rhyme scheme. WB Yeats famously said that if the usual act of writing a poem is like scrambling a pair of eggs, then writing a poem in a tight form means scrambling eggs while performing a backflip. Now imagine scrambling eggs and performing 1,400 backflips while simultaneously calling your mum and you'll get a sense of just how ridiculously amazing this piece of work is. And they're not even like cheap rhymes or anything, these are clever, confident, original rhymes throughout. I've read a few contemporary long poems in forum before like Bemborek's Donjon Heights, but Jerusalem Deleted is on a whole different level. In fact, I have no problems in saying that this is one of the most significant books of poetry published in 2015 and also also, some of the parts in it are really genuinely beautiful. There's some really good poetry in here. Now I know what you must be asking yourself. Tell me what's in it for me, or what's the catch? Okay, admittedly this is a very interesting book of poetry, but there are a number of things that went tremendously pear-shaped. Let me list them. Number one. The plot. The plot concerns a narrator who's traveling across some kind of a futuristic wasteland looking for a girl called Julie. We never really figure out who this Julie is because she's kind of a platonic ideal like Petrarch's Laura. Shouldn't that be like Plato's Laura? Wait, if she's... A now, to be completely honest, the plot doesn't really go anywhere. You spend the whole book following this guy as he comes across post-apocalyptic landscapes, characters, landscapes, more characters, landscapes, other characters, and so on. The closest thing I can think of is playing Half-Life 2, except you don't get to shoot shit and you don't have to deal with those goofy crabs that sort of suck your face. This story is quite obviously science fiction, which is a weird choice for an epic. It's like making a Super Mario game that is about calisthenics, and the only reason I can see Jarvis choosing this genre is because of his background. Hello, I am Jarvis. You are Ultra, a global peacekeeping initiative designed by Mr. Stark. I mean, maybe it could work if the language weren't so inconsistent. One second he's talking about computers and some modern medicine, and the next he's making references that come straight out of Dante's Divine Comedy. I'll admit it's a brave choice of genre by jarring, but it's really Jarvis. Jarving. Jarsing. Jarvin. Jarod. Jarring. Number 2. The Obscure Vocabulary I'd like to specify that I really enjoy finding new and obscure words when I'm reading poetry because I like the idea of expanding my vocabulary. Having said that, there has to be a point where getting slapped in the face with impossible terms starts getting on your bloody nerves. Now you can actually measure scientifically whether Jarvis overdid it with the obscure vocabulary by comparing it to that scene in The Matrix Reloaded where Neo takes 45 minutes to beat up a clone army of Hugo Weavings. Ergo, concordantly, vis-a-vis, -vis. you know what? I have no idea what the hell I'm saying. The principle is this, if it takes me longer to list out all of the words that I had to look up in Jerusalem deleted than it takes Neo to beat up all of his agents, then the list is clearly over long. Let's give this a try.
Now in fairness, the point isn't even so much about quantity. An obscure word can be a good thing in an individual poem because by necessity you'll end up reading it several times, so learning the word the first time unlocks a new experience when reading it the second time. But this doesn't really work in an epic and how the fuck does Jarvis not get this? An epic is not just a poem, it's fundamentally a narrative and it's kind of hard to follow a narrative when you have to stop every 5 seconds to open a dictionary. What the hell does it mean for a character to be trying something proprioceptionally? Number 3 classical mythology. Okay, this is kind of a quibble and I suppose you won't give any more of a damn than I do about how many garbage skips you can skip, but I'm kind of perplexed about the classical references in Jerusalem deleted. Let's take for example the Greek myth of Danai. The story goes that a possessive father locks away his daughter in an effort to keep her from getting pregnant, but Zeus takes the form of a golden rain and falls on the girl, which has the effect of impregnating her. This is how Jarvis decides to reference the story. Bright as Tiepolo, the light blues fly up from his lap there, like a cold inversion of those rich showers which the rapist god let fall on the night, that his rich perversion might cash prime poets so to kiss his raw as this dire crime should seem a mere excursion. So basically, if you ever wrote a poem about the night, then you are a cocksucker. Even by the incredibly low standards of classical revisionism nowadays, this has to be the most inelegant thing I've ever read. Besides which, I don't get it. The story of the Nye is essentially a myth of the virgin birth story. The closest parallel is Mary of Nazareth. If you're going to sermonize about rape, then write about Lida or about Brisset or about some other story in which someone actually has sex. Number four, the editorial decision. Whatever you may say about the poem, Jerusalem Deleted has to be one of the most reader unfriendly books published this decade. There isn't an introduction, there isn't an author bio, there isn't even a blurb on the back of the book. All we get is this incredibly helpful note on the first page, which tells us that this poem is set in the remote and near future and in the distant and recent past. It remains at the date of publication unbaptized and may therefore not accurately be referred to as, say, an Anglican poem. Jarvis, what the fuck are you smoking and can I have a puff? Seriously, at least you could have split this poem into chapters and ideally added synopsis for each chapter at the end of the book. This is literally 7,000 lines of verse stumbling over itself without break. At one point I had to stop reading Jerusalem Deleted for a couple of months and by the time I came back to it I had no clue as to who the fuck was doing what or why. There's one character called Koda and I'd forgotten who he was and I swear when I came back to the book I thought this guy was Koba from Planet of the Apes. I appreciate maybe Jarvis was trying to protect the integrity of the poem, but if you ignore the needs of your readers so completely, there comes a point when it stops being about integrity and it becomes about vanity. And you can see the effects of it on the book's Amazon page, where there's only one customer review, and it was actually written by the author. Conclusions. This is certainly an impressive and sometimes beautiful work, but it's undermined by some questionable choices in genre and style. Furthermore, the really terrible editorial decisions make the book needlessly confusing and intractable. Jerusalem Deleted does reward. No argument. It's just that the reward is not commensurate to the cost of reading it. And I'm not talking about the price. 